everybody. Welcome back to D&J's Epic Quest. My name is Justin. Today it is Dren is... again. And also, we are joined by the author, HC. How are you? Hi. I'm good. I didn't know I was going to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a nice surprise. I'm glad my, I wasn't having, yes. I was having a horrible hair day the other day and I was supposed to be on camera. So I'm glad at least my hair is kind of tame today. <laughs> Well, your forehead's kind of cut oh, off. I do that frame, on purpose because so. it looks massive in in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Mine's a disaster too. Oh no! <laughs> I mean, oh goodness, Jimmy Neutron. Yeah. Um, anyway, okay. Well, I take back oh, my name. Lord. I'm going oh, to Lord. be Gilly all today. Right. Gilly. Yep. Because. That you character speak, would hate me calling him Gilly. Like Gilly. Oh no, this is not a good near accent. <laughs> I'm so bad at, at Scottish accents, but I'll I'll try. <laughs> this uh this will be a lot of fun because I think we've conned HD into uh joining us for the rest of the episodes that we do for this book. So um I think fun. it'll work out good because if you're busy on a particular week, I mean it's we have another book that we're covering, so we, we can we can make things work. So, I'm never uh, so it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, are you sure we can give you one last <laughs> chance to back up? Uh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> JK, lol. But it, it is really exciting to right. to have you. It's uh, like I guess I don't know about you, Justin, but I don't think I've ever really thought about having an author on really like at the beginning of the book and throughout. It's just kind of a thought we've had at the end of the book. And so now we're really screwing things up for ourselves here. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, our sense of wrongness is definitely going to, uh, be scrutinized a little bit heavier. <laughs> <I'll>... <laughs> Maybe more some instant gratifications as to like, Oh yeah, you know, you were wrong on that. Like the whole eating pussy thing last time. <laughs> Uh, that was something that uh, I just missed the connection with him singing. Um, <laughs> um, Justin's got a dirty mind. Don't let him fool you. This is why we can be hard to handle sometimes. Lork also has a dirty mind, so it kind of fit, really. Well, but... I should be Lork. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. We'll figure it out. <laughs> that means Drin has to be Gilly. Good luck. <laughs> Like I said, we'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I suppose we should move on to our patrons. Uh, would you like the honors today, or do you want me to do it, Sir Derek? Um, you can go ahead. All right. So our Patreons in order of patronage, uh, we got Jan, the picker of pies, Luciana, our lady of fantasy, Brian, the topological, Nate, fiddle me this, Damien, the rock with faces, shield anvil dylan and then parker little thank you all so much for your patronage again it's still very surreal uh to produce something that people actually like so thank you again so much definitely it's a lot of fun and it's it's led us here today to to doing this with the author so not something i would have thought uh you know a year ago that we'd be doing this so no it's a lot of fun I don't know, HC and I were chatting yesterday, and it's, you know, I feel like it's mutually beneficial. It's probably not too often an author gets to go through a first-time reader of their book, so. It's so fun. <clears throat> I wish everybody did it. I sound like a robot. It's so fun. I wish everybody did it. I love talking about my book. Whenever I was listening to your podcast, I was just, like, typing to you guys, just responding to everything. I was like, I wish I could just respond to you in time, like, in real time. Well, well, now you have that opportunity. Yes. I don't know. I feel like in a couple episodes, you're going to be like, oh, my God, these guys, like, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe. <laughs> maybe. A little bit. Maybe. Um, uh, I, do you want to... <laughs> do you want to hear my car story justin i know I, oh I never yes yes so i end up with covid derek is sends me this weird picture of his freaking wheel uh like drove into the like his uh fuck what are those called the the disc uh, things just driven into the brake yeah the rotors so 
I guess maybe we should come up with a contingency plan, Justin, because it it really wasn't probably too unrealistic that uh, if my wheel came off on the highway that I might not have lived. Um, we might have had half a quest here. It might have been just Jay's quest after that. Uh, I don't know uh, if I would continue on if uh, something were to happen. You can take um, with me. It's the conspiracy. Oh, <laughs> uh, you better catch up on Malazan then. Oh no! I have to. I don't know. Is this the first book? I found it at Goodwill like four years ago, and I didn't know what it was. Yes, that is the first book. Yes. Oh wait, it says book one. Yes. We're on this book one for what? Gardens of Earth. Oh, Gardens are you holding up a book? I don't. I don't have my camera up right now. I can't see. Um. Yeah. Yeah. My my. So I started hearing this noise on my Jeep, and I'm like, "What the hell is this?" And. So I was looking and I thought it was like the uh, wheel well liner, like it came loose and was rubbing on the tire or something. Uh, so I thought that's what it was for like a day. I'm like, well, it'll be a little annoying, but then it kept getting worse. And so I checked the other side and the wheel well liner was the same way. There was a little bit of give to it. I'm like, okay, well, it's not that bad. I'm not a freaking mechanic, so I'm, I don't know stuff. Um so I, I thought maybe a wheel bearing was going out. So I made an appointment to bring it to where I go for that type of stuff. And so I left work a little bit early and I work out of town. So I'm on the highway and I was like legitimately pretty scared because um, it was as loud as it had ever been. Um, but I didn't really have any like vibrations or anything. So like I was white knuckle driving. I'm like, oh God, I just hope I make it there. And so HC, Justin and I grew up in the same town, but so I get to the top of Madison Avenue Hill. I made it off the highway, but it was really like weird because if there was like a turn on the highway, I felt like I was kind of floating. <laughs> um, and then, so I get off the highway, I get into town and I'm literally probably um, less than a mile away from the shop. I get to the top of Madison Avenue Hill and my fucking tire flies off. My back end drops and I just hear a crunch and I'm like, damn it. I still had momentum. I was able to get off the street into a parking lot and my tire bounces across the three remaining lanes of traffic, hit a power line pole, bounces and comes back across all four lanes of traffic and lands like 30 or 40 feet in front of me. And somehow does not hit another car in the process. Uh, That's terrifying. So I pick up my, I pick up my tire, and I'm pretty pissed off. <laughs> and so, I, I I took a picture right away, and then uh, I called my insurance to get the tow, and they told me that I didn't have roadside insurance, so it was going to come out of my pocket. I'm like, fine, whatever. Like, I doesn't matter. I I, I can't drive. I need a tow. So like, okay, we'll send you a text with a link in it. You can put your credit card info in. It's going to be $180. I'm like, whatever. It doesn't matter what it costs. So I get the text. I open it up. I put my info in. And like the submit button does not work. <laughs> so I cannot submit it. So I call him back and get a different person. And uh, he says, oh, you know, he goes through his spiel. And he's like, it's going to be $160. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. The other, I don't really give a shit about $20 right now, but the other lady told me it was 180 And he's like, oh, well, we got to figure that out because I don't want to charge you too much and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, <laughs> so he puts me on hold and he comes back and he's like, oh, I'm still working on it. And so like, Justin knows I'm a pretty calm person and I didn't yell at this guy, but I told him next time you come back, if you don't have somebody to take my payment, I'm going to hang up on you. And so that's what I did because he didn't have somebody take my payment and I called just called the tow company directly and saved a hundred dollars. It was $75 to get a tow. Wow. Um, yeah. Insurance companies crooks. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got, got my car to the shop, told them what happened. And it was by that time it was getting towards the end of the day. Um, the next day, the GM of the store called me, asked me what happened. And uh, so really what I think happened is I got new tires, like, uh, I think today would be two months. I got new tires two months ago today and that I got out of there after the store closed. So I think the guy rushed it and they were like probably 80% torqued, you know, to where they needed to be. And just over time they loosened up until my wheel flew off 
yeah, it was, <laughs> it was pretty scary. Cause like the day before I had my kids in the car, my niece in the car, my wife, like, um, you know, you just think about all that stuff. And so I was pretty lucky how it turned out, but we left the shop and my wife was pissed at me because I didn't throw a fit in the store. By that time, enough time had passed. I cooled off. And when I talked to the GM, she just asked me what happened and said, okay, we'll take care of this, this, and this. And we'll check on one thing. My, my Jeep has like most cars have springs for suspension. Mine has air suspension. So it's got airbags. So when the tire came off after I picked it up, I heard this pop that sounded like a gunshot <laughs> and I'm like, Oh great. Either my axle just broke or an airbag exploded and it was an airbag. So as far as I know right now, they're covering everything. I don't think I'm going to have to pay for any of it. Um, and if I have to pay for anything, then maybe we'll have a, uh, a little bit more different of a conversation, but hopefully I should have it here next, this upcoming week sometime. Some litigation if uh, that's not the case. God damn, dude. Well, I'm just glad that you're safe and that like it could have been bad if I was on the highway going 60 miles an hour and my tire flew off like it probably would hit somebody on the highway. <laughs> like uh, yeah. I think about it I'm like, man, I was lucky. Like people working there, they don't realize you need like what can happen if they don't pay attention like that. Like that, that, that could really hurt you just because they're ready to get home. That's scary. That's I'm glad yeah. they took care of it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean. The way it's been handled so far, I'll probably be pretty faithful to this shop because in my eyes, they're, they're doing me right. You know, if they just told me to piss off, then, then I would throw a fit and, you know, <laughs> effectively try to burn every bit bridge that I could with them. Um, wow. But they've treated me really well, all things considered. So that's because they know if they didn't, then they would pay much more in damages than what it would cost to just fix up your vehicle. Yeah, it's it's easier to, I mean, I'm sure she's got to explain to her boss, you know, why they're doing it. But yeah, it's going to be easier to keep a customer than, sorry, my beer's foaming all over. Oh, wow. Yes, I'm drinking at 1230. <laughs> Judge me. It's five o'clock somewhere. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's easier to just take care of it than lose a customer and bad press and blah, 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 blah. So that was that's my story. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Good intro story. <laughs> exactly. Usually we have something to talk about and and uh yeah, that was it. Yeah. I didn't end on a good note at least. Yeah. So far, yeah. I still don't have my car back. I've got my dad's truck for the meantime, but luckily he's he's got a work car that he can use and he's gonna be out of town all this week, so it's really not too big a deal. Uh yeah. Well, can't even imagine what that's <laughs> there. Sorry. But all right. Cool. Well, I guess uh at this point we should probably move on, eh? I guess HC Howard. Yeah. Oh, we never fucking <laughs> God, terrible host. What the hell? <laughs> I'm good. You're good. I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> just along for the ride. All right. Well. Yeah. I mean, I have a tire story. It's just that my hubcap fell off and they won't replace it. Yay. <laughs> After they've replaced my tire. But you sort of beat me with your tire story. So I don't even want to tell mine anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that sucks. They won't replace it. It's annoying. Because obviously it was their fault because it was on when we got the tire changed. And now it is gone two days later. So but they were just like, well, it must have been loose before. I was like, then you should have tightened it. You changed the tire. Right. Yeah, just, yeah, it's a freaking hubcap. Just take care of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's gone, though. I have to replace it. It fell off while we were driving. So we don't have a hubcap, oh, and the car looks got kind you. of janky on that one side, but it's okay. Yeah, I hear the hubcaps. Without them, they uh, they make your, your car go faster. Oh, uh, well, I have a Nissan Versa, so <laughs> it's, like, it's like just a cheap old whatever car. So we don't go fast on that thing, so I can't attest to that. <laughs> If we go too fast, it starts to shake because it's so top heavy. <laughs> oh, da, 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 da. Yeah, got it. Oh. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, uh, how about we, should we kick off chapters three and four from H.C. Newell's Curse of the Fallen here? Sure. Uh, so we want to take a moment to thank and recognize Silverstone's books. Check out their website at silverstonesbooks.com. They have a pretty large selection of fantasy, sci-fi, and horror books uh, with many signed 
by the authors at very reasonable prices. They also carry the largest uh, selection I've seen of indie and self-published authors. So help us help them in supporting self-published authors. And don't forget, if you use the code DJQuest, you can get 10% off your next order. Um, I've looked around their website a little bit, and I have seen some, uh, I know, Justin, you said you were going to look for, I don't remember what you were going to look for on there, but I have seen some, I guess, not self-published books on there. Um, Realm of the Elderlings is the one that sticks out of my mind, Robin Hobbs books. But um, HC, I don't know if you were ever on there. I didn't see your books on there right now, but I don't know if they ever were at one point or not. No, uh, my books are not printed um, through Ingram Spark, which is who Silverstone buys through. So I did speak to them about a year ago, um, but I just haven't been able to get the production right to be able for them to stock my book, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But they're amazing, seriously. So anybody, definitely check them out. They're really good and they're really good people. They're so nice. That's really awesome of you to say, even though they don't carry your book right now. Yeah, so I mean. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Well, they were going to. It's my fault that they don't. <laughs> they asked me to. But I mean, still, even if they don't, they're still awesome. So I'm going to support them. I think it's awesome what they're doing for the indie community. It is really. A- yeah, I, I, it's very cool. Yeah, this is an indie podcast. So, you know, we're all just scratching each other's backs. I like it. There we go. Well, Justin, you want to start us off here with chapter three? Yes, I definitely can. Um, and chapter three is titled Cave of the Ancients. And HC, if you want to take away the epigraph for chapter three here. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I didn't know this would be asked of me. <clears throat> you did not figure out how to say these words. Oh, goodness. I wish I would have known. Okay. Salik Nerun for Vatel Enclave. The blood of the first holds the key. First blood prophecy. Oh, ruin that. <laughs> no, that was great. It was much better than I would have done. <laughs> cool. Well, here I go. Nier awoke from a long and restless sleep. As she stretched, she became aware of the bandages wrapping her shoulder. There was a stain of blood that had bled through. She leaned forward and rubbed her face. Noticing her surroundings, they were still in the cave. Lorik and Gil were snoring loudly, not far from her. She stood up and observed observed that it was still raining outside. She couldn't tell if it was morning or night. They would be stuck inside this dreary cave until sunlight poked through the clouds. Vleeland was far too dangerous to travel in the dark. Backing away from the entrance, she scanned the cavern. She walked towards the others when a voice called out. She whirled, trying to find the source of the voice. Clutching the hilt of her sword, she called out. Hello? Who's there? Lork was awoken by her voice, and she whirled around. Seeing her sword drawn, he reeled back. He asked her what she was doing and if she had lost her mind. Continuing to look around, she explains that something was here, as something had spoken to her. Uh, Lork groaned as he got to his feet. He explained that this was an Imaril, and there was magic all around them. She explained to him that this was different. Lork asks what she was doing. He kicks Gil awake, telling him to get up as near as gone crazy. Gil was not happy about the way he was awakened, and after some small threats, Lork tells him to look at what Nier was doing. Gil moved to her side. He asked what had gotten into her, and she couldn't just, and she should just calm down. She remarked that something was here and was interrupted as her hand slipped through the wall. Gil explains that it's a mirage his tone indicating that he was surprised and afraid. He said that he's heard about this. He's, he just thought that it was a myth. Lork says that they should all go inside. Gil has hesitations and attempts to make his position on the matter known. Glaring at Lork, Nier explains that she's fine and something had spoken to her as it called her name. Gil takes Nier's hands and pleads that it's too dangerous and they should wait here. Nier turned back to the mirage, where a strong sense of magic tugged her forward. She grabbed her belongings and a rune. She explains that the Arun are too dangerous and mysterious for normal scholars. She explains to the others that it wasn't a coincidence that they wound up here. 
in a cave of the ancients. Something was calling her inside, and she thinks it could lead to her answers. Lorik groaned and shook his head. Fate was something he didn't want to believe in. Gil is heard asking if she's sure. She replied that yes, she is. The Gil nodded and then backed away and told her to lead the way. With her belongings and Arun, she stood at the wall and took one final look at her friends before entering. Glowing yellow stones lined the walls in swirling, swirling patterns that lit up the narrow corridor. Near inhaled deeply. The three eventually made their way deeper until they entered a cavern. Hundreds of crystals stood throughout the cave, leaving a soft light that illuminated the cavern. A large tree stood in the center of the cavern. They all stood there, staring in wonder. They saw a doorway at the other side of the cavern. When they entered, the pathway inside was lit up with glowing stones along the wall. Along the way, they passed several doors, but all of them were locked. Gil came to a stop, and Lork tripped over him. Lork blames Gil for stopping. They three, the three realized that they stood at an intersection of many corridors. Lork asked if this was a, a neighborhood. Gil stated that this looked safe enough, and whoever had called near forward knew they'd need a place to stay, and there should be rooms around here somewhere. Lork asked Gilly how he knew so much about this place. Gilly retorts that he's told the dude a hundred times and then kicks the shin of Lork. The man grips his shin with a loud cry. Gilly told him that if he calls him that one more time, it won't be his shin he kicks, but his balls. Gilly and Lork argue some more. Nier could be heard chuckling at their conversation. Angrily, Lork asks Nier what is so damn funny. Nier just shrugs and tells Gil that just because he's old as dirt doesn't mean he knows everything about these forbidden caves. Gilly humbly agreed and said that there should be rooms around here somewhere. Lork asked if Gil was sure they would, should be staying here. It was giving him the creeps. Nier jokes that Ebert is scared. Ebard. Ebard is scared. Lord Lork admits that he is, and it's because this place was magic, and they could be led straight into a trap. With a smile, uh, with a smile, she said that it was best that they stay outside and keep a watch. She then wandered down the hall. Lork facepalmed himself and stated that she was going to be the death of him. They all then wandered down and were relieved to find several unlocked doors leading to small bedrooms. Gil picks a room and wonders if there were any clothes that would fit a drelid or dwarf lying about. Nier suggested that they explore the place a bit more. Lork didn't like the thought of that and voices his opinion on not lurking where they don't belong. Nier attempts to respond to this before Lork cuts her off, saying that he's not a child and that she needs to start using that brain of hers before she gets them all killed. Nier doesn't take the statement seriously, which causes Lork to storm off. Nier wished he would come back, though. Gil from underneath some blankets said to Nier that Lork was right. Nier responded by asking what was wrong with looking around. Gil tells her that she's been she's always been stubborn and reminds her about Master Raymond taught her. She tells Gil that she was also taught to trust her instincts and to never let fear guide her action. Actions. Gil says that it's a slippery slope, messing with the unknown. He says that he trusts her to make the right decision. Nier wondered if that meant his decision. Gil explains that he's not a survivor, and nor was Lork. She's been doing this her whole life. Gil explains, explains that they are here because they trust her. She told him goodnight and then stepped out into the hall. With her face in her hands, she thought about every decision that had brought them here. All that she had worked so hard for could be lost. This place was perfect for an ambush, but yet there was something more. Something she was meant to find. It called out to her. And what were the chances that they would be transported to the doorstep of an ancient magical cave? With an angry grunt, she marched down the hall and stepped back into the cave with the enormous stone pillar. She examined her shoulder. While most of it was her own blood, there were some that were Lork's too. She became, became sad at the thought of losing Lork. After the loss of her family, he was the one that convinced her that there was hope. Nirana. She turned with a gasp, 
Her blood ran cold as she found herself alone. She mustered herself to say, Hello? She calls out for it to show itself. The glowing stones had lost their luminescence, and the room was dark. She felt a cold rush through her, nudging her forward. She called out, wondering this, what this was. A voice whispered to trust in her ear. A floating orb of light hovered at the end of the hall. She followed the orb until it reached a single door. The light faded as it sank into the door. She checked her surroundings, making sure she was indeed alone. Her heart pounded in her chest as she placed her hand on the door. She hesitated as she realized that this could have been a trap, a magical something left behind by the enclave. Something bigger drew her here. It has called her name and asked for her trust. She needed to see what was inside. She needed to know why she was led so deep into this ancient tomb. With a deep breath, she pushed through the fear and decided to trust in fate. The door opened and Nier stepped inside. Hundreds of glowing crystals lined the walls. Nier turned with wide eyes as she set her sights on a beautiful library of tomes and scrolls. Nier stepped further in the room, keeping an eye out for traps that could be waiting for her. In the center was a desk. She explained the item. She examined the items on its surface. Piles of scrolls, crumbled notes, enchanted prisms, and glowing orbs cluttered the desk. Looking around the room once again, her eyes fixed on a magical object lying between two books on a shelf. She smiled at herself. She walked to the golden object laying on the shelf. The spectral magnificator was believed to transform natural light into a key for ruins and various other enchanted items. It was a rare item and had only been heard of in old wives' tales and legends. The cold rush moved through her again. She turned and found the glowing light hovering above a nightstand. She rummaged through the drawers and found a blue book marked by gold trim symbols. She used her magic to help her read the book. The book's title was Magical Ruins. Her excited laughter echoed throughout the room. This is what you were leading me to. She was speaking to the light, but it had already disappeared. She gathered all the books and settled in front of the hearth. The plush rug was warm and soft on her butt cheeks, but the chill of the cave would not leave her bones. The logs within the fireplace were perfectly preserved. She knew that without warmth and light, she wouldn't last too much longer. She found a flint underneath some parchment. She lit the logs ablaze. She got cozy next to the fire before going back to her stack of books. Opening the cover of the Falendel, she read through several chapters before coming to one that piqued her interest. The Arun, it read, was a small object which holds immense magical properties. Reciting the spell inscribed along the Arun shall dispel the call of the mark. The Arun may be activated by way of the Trinidal, or, for the most gifted mages, the Trials of Blood. The Trials of Blood? She said aloud to know. The trials are a perilous journey through which magic user must overcome fear, adversity, and strength as they survive the forbidden tombs leading to the hidden cave of Nahamishal. Upon entering the cave, the mage must harness the energy flowing through the waters and recite the incantation inscribed along the Arun to release the call of the mark. Nir dug out the Arun and examined the inscription, focusing on her energy to understand the language she found herself still unable to decipher it. She turned her attention back to the book. Whoever shall harness the energy within the Arun may use its power once, after which it shall fade to ash. Nier pondered the meaning of Triandal. Through her years of study, she had never heard of such a thing. She felt more confused than ever, and so read the chapter with the Trials of Blood again. A small section explained the whereabouts of the trials along the border of Lynn and Vleland. She then, she now understood the path she must take to rid herself of the curse and finally be free. It was the reason she had been led to this cave and she wouldn't interfere with her fate. She was going to face the trials of blood and lift the curse for good. Nice job, guys. Thanks. I tried. Are we going to have a competition? Who screws up the most words? I'm keeping tally. Let's see what we got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. God damn it. It's really not your fault, though. My words 
are wacky. So no, it's okay. I think it's just one of those things where they're not quite muscle memory yet. So uh, it'll happen eventually. The more I beat it into your head, the more you'll get it. I feel like. <laughs> My specialty is more with narration than anything else. But you gotta pronounce the words right to be a good narrator. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeesh! I, oh. I'm done. Ouch! Just I, I'm out. I can't do this no more. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> uh, but anyway, what a very suspense-filled chapter, eh? For yes. sure. Uh, HC, I. I guess before we get too deep into Justin's thoughts here, I feel like this is probably a question we would like leave. Like if we had the author on at the end of the book, but since you're here now, I'm, I'm curious as to like, how did you form this idea for not only just this book, but this like series as a whole, like what was your journey with it? Um, well, it started in about 2011 or 12, something like that. And it was actually a young adult novel and I wanted it to be a trilogy, but I came to find that I really couldn't do that because I was leaning more towards like romance when I was doing young adult, which didn't have to be, but I was. So it, it eventually transformed into this really long, big, dark fantasy series. Um, I don't really know how it's started though i did get a lot of inspiration am i even answering your question i feel like i'm not even answering your question yeah no i think you're <laughs> <He's> saying no <laughs> <laughs> you said how did i get the feedback i'm giving you i mean i feel like i were able what did you ask me you asked me how i got started <laughs> didn't you <laughs> yeah like you're just what well, kind of where like the idea came from and everything just yeah. for this chapter no, no, for the, the oh. just the, the book series and everything. Like, what I guess, what what uh, I guess inspired you to like write this and create it? Yeah, see, I was answering the question. I'm blocking his camera from view. You're um, getting there. I I can't see you. I've got I've got our document open. So. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really hard question to answer though. But as I started really getting into the Fall and Light series, what gave me inspiration, I guess would be um, like Skyrim and The Witcher and uh, Final Fantasy really gave me a lot of inspiration. So that's where a lot of, I guess, the idea sort of culminated from um, would be something like that. I mean, that's a really hard question to answer though, because I've been working on this for over 10 years. <laughs> and so I, I, I guess I would assume you like, you know how it's ending and it's just writing the journey to get there. Oh yeah. And piecing everything together. I'm finding now that I'm a book, on book three, I find that's really hard to start piecing everything together and putting everything where it needs to be so it all flows well. Because I know everything that's going to happen and I know how it's going to end. It's just getting there and making sure it's good is the hard part. Gotcha. That's just my like one big like question I had um, <laughs> that at, at some point, whether it was now or at the end of the book, I, I wanted to ask you. Because I just, I find that really like fascinating. Like, I mean, there's millions of books out there and, and where do, where do these ideas come from to put its paper and, and, you know, write it down and everything. Um, just fascinates me. Yeah, it definitely um, kind of transformed over the years, but it started about 10 years ago and it was a YA and the core, like the bones of the story are the same. So kind of like the plot and near are kind of the same everything else is kind of just transformed over the years into what it is so it's really just i don't know things that i've experienced and other forms of media and stuff like that has really kind of helped me open my imagination i suppose cool well thank you for answering hopefully i answered it okay <laughs> yeah i tend to ramble <laughs> that's that's fine pretty much all we do on this podcast is ramble okay so. I'm just looking at uh, Justin's face the whole time, and he makes me nervous. <laughs> Why do I make you nervous? What am I doing? You're like, you're just like, I'm just listening intently. Mm -hmm. That's all. No, <laughs> your your intent face makes me nervous. <laughs> get another one. I don't like it. You'll you'll have to get used to my faces. I'm just uh, you know, as as we've talked, animator. You know, I'm just very facially expressive. I don't I don't know. So, you do it. <laughs> I won't take it personally next time. Yeah, don't take it personally, please. I won't take your face personally next time. 
<laughs> I'm trying not to piss you off. I don't know what you're so worried about me. Me? <laughs> yeah, I say shit wrong. Oh, it's my fault. It's okay. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. Well, if you don't like the book, you're wrong. So it's okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> Uh, I guess one of my, one of the, the first things that uh, I had here was the statement where Vleland was far too dangerous to travel in the dark. And I guess it's just the smallest glimmer of light was the difference between life and death. God damn. In, you know, a land that seems to be cursed with constant storms. And I would imagine you probably couldn't even tell whether it would be day or night kind of just makes their situation all the more precarious, I guess. So it was just nice to, to have that, that in there to just kind of escalate the situation that they're in. You kind of get a nice, cool sense of the desperation that they find themselves in. Yeah. Like you better not go out after dark. Well, I guess it's always dark, but you better not. uh, If you don't see light, you better just stay put. Right, like there's a, a specific pocket of time that you have to time just right in order to escape. Like, that's a lot of mental gymnastics, you know? Yeah, and I mean, the Knicks that live there, the race that lives there, they need constant shade. So the sunlight, it's almost like vampires in a way. The sunlight kind of harms them. So they can go out during the day. However, they're kind of nocturnal. But as long as they're shade, they are able to be out, and they are very dangerous. I did not even make that connection that it was similar to vampires. <laughs> I mean, they're not vampires, but it's just the easiest sort of uh, comparison. Sure. Fair enough. All right. Okay, so uh, when Lork, Gil, and Nier essentially are kind of having more or less this like fate conversation with with each other, uh, fate was reserved for those that followed the six. Uh, and we are told that Lork has a deep hatred for all powerful beings or anything he or anything he because of their will or judgment. Uh, they are named the divines. And apparently the order had forced the population to believe. And I get a really strong sense of Christianity here. I don't know if you all feel the same. I know. HC, you have your own thoughts, but Derek, what are you? Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, let's go on a crusade, start lopping heads of the non-believers. <laughs> That's kind of what it sounds like, nah? <laughs> well, maybe not necessarily the non-believers, but those that uh, are demons, right? Or they? No, no, no. I mean, re- religion will do some uh, weird things to people. Well, HC, you have your little like zippy face emoji here in the notes. So <laughs> I'm assuming we're probably dead on, and that's maybe where the inspiration for the order has come from. Oh my God. Wow. Okay. This must be a spoiler thing. So I guess we'll just move on. <laughs> How is that a spoiler? <laughs> I don't know. You're zipping your lips. I'm just saying I'm not, neither confirming nor denying that Christianity has played a role in the order that's what i'm saying (laughs) by not confirming or denying i think you've affirmed that it has i have not said anything i don't know the zippy lip the zippy lip emoji the zippy lip i like to leave things open-ended even in my writing so you can infer and have your own opinion of what i mean or do not mean fair enough fair enough okay well i mean i get huge christian vibes from it which It's fine because, you know, I feel like most people, most people kind of understand as they have some type of, I wouldn't say education, but familiarity with it, uh, whether they choose to stick with that. uh, As they become a teenager, an adult, there is at least some familiarity there. So if it was based on an organized religion like Christianity, it would be more of like the, is archaic the right word, more of the original kind of belief system if that makes sense so not saying that so not not like so are you saying that like modern christians are not new age i guess or old you know i i guess what are you trying to say there that i am saying that 
it isn't modern day. If it like had anything to do with Christianity, it would be directly straight from what the holy book says it should be, not what people have turned it into. That does that make sense? Gotcha. So all the if it was. Like, oh, well, the book says you can't do this, but, like, in the book, it doesn't really even mention anything about it. Yeah, or the book does say this, but we don't want to listen to that. It's very, the order is a very straightforward type of religion, which is how a lot of religion would be if you took it very literally and straightforward as how it's written, which, I mean, you can say that about most religions. Yes, it seems very, like, rigid, like, if it's not this way, it's, like, it's not right. Yeah, they don't have any room for interpretation with the with the order. It's this is our rules, this is what the gods want, and you're gonna follow that, or we're going to smite you because that's what the gods tell us to do. Until Bob gets there. <laughs> yep. Good old Bob. <laughs> that's probably what they need in order to not be so rigid anymore. <laughs> Justin. What? <laughs> Maybe I took that a different way than you intended. I don't no, know. no, 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 no. I think you got what I was trying to. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess one of my favorite pieces was when they're coming into this cavern and the large tree stood in the center. I just, you know, immediately went straight to the, the cover of the book, you know, um, and being that I've had just kind of my own visions of it but yeah it was just it was it was just really cool headcanon to be able to just see these three characters and just this like super like far out shot you know they look super like tiny in comparison um and just all these like glowing lights inside of this like really wet dark dank cavern yeah it was just really cool to envision so i really wasn't expecting uh the cover to show up show itself up in near the beginning of the book so that was cool yeah and i feel like a lot of times in books like you don't always necessarily get like the the scene on the cover right i mean sometimes you do but yeah or you have to like dig really really hard into the writing to find it so like i know with robert jordan knife of dreams that is the prologue you know and the whole time like before i even got to that book i'm like I wonder what the hell this is concerning. And I find out that the female figure on there isn't even who I thought it was. So it was like, oh, okay, cool. (laughs) Well, I mean, to be fair, though, um, the the tree on the cover actually isn't the one in Blowland that you saw. But they are the same type of tree, so it can still work. Like, you still get the tree. But my idea was for the tree the scene on the cover is uh, actually a scene from the book it's just later in the book but i can i mean it's still the same tree so i can see how you guys would would get that and it's it is really i thought it was interesting too to kind of get what is on the cover in the book i really liked that idea so it's the tree and not michelle yeah. right maybe cool <laughs> you said it right i know not michelle I'm cheating. <laughs> Read the pronunciation guide. It works. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's just hard to do when I'm like, you know, summarizing. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. It's okay. I always like hearing how everybody butchers my words. Yeah. <laughs> and I always like to tell them to read the pronunciation guide because I didn't make that thing for no reason. No, that's fair. I mean, you gotta, <laughs> gotta get, you know, use what you, you worked on. Right. Gotta give credit where credit's due. And then HC, I know that you put in something. Another thing is during when Gil is kind of explaining to Nier uh, that she is a, a survivor and they are not. And I'm sure this is probably a Rafa moment or potentially spoiler territory, but uh, like it was just kind of cool to get a little bit of like a little brief introduction to to Nier's backstory here and it's just one of those things where like what did she survive and I know that she went through a changing but I don't know if that would necessarily consider that as what she survived from being that so many of that changing procedure fail I definitely think that there's more here there's more to it and I guess I'm just really excited to to discover more about what it is that she survived 
I'm assuming it has something to do with the order of sorrow, but I could be wrong. Um, I mean, I'm not going to answer your question, but I will say that I like for readers to experience the story and experience the world and experience what the characters have been through as they read. So I think, I think a lot of books, and I could be wrong here because I don't read a lot of books, but I think a lot of them really kind of tell you the backstory and they kind of like do sort of like info dumps a little bit every now and then. And with, with near, cause I've had some people complain about this. Um, you kind of, you kind of find out what she's been through as the story goes on, kind of like what you said with these snippets of she's a survivor. Well, later you'll kind of find out what she survived and then later you'll find out how she survived it sort of like that. So that it'll get answered. Oh, it absolutely. Yeah, no, I've, I've come to, I mean, really, uh, I guess it's one of those things where the phenomena of just reading on and finding out is 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 nine out of ten times going to answer your question. And I think that nowadays people just, for whatever reason, just get impatient, you know, and I feel like that's technology's fault. But at the end of the day, like, for example, the survivor thing, it almost kind of like mentally puts a pin in her story. And then as you continue to read on, you know, like you're constantly looking for things that would relate to Survivor. And it just makes it more of an enthralling experience. It makes you connect with these characters a little bit more. Yeah. And I mean, that was kind of the goal. I didn't, I don't really think I did that on purpose, but it was, like I said, just kind of experience and kind of learn as you go, not really through info dumps, but just through experience. I don't like to say things outright. I like for you to kind of have your own in- opinion and interpretation and really be invested to understand. Um, there was another thing I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> something about something. I think that way, though, it, to me, it feels like that's a good way to keep the reader invested. Like, okay, well, I, I got a little piece here. I got to keep reading and you get another little piece and and so forth. So it's, I don't mind the info dumps, but I also I, I don't mind just getting little pieces here and there as long as it keeps building. Yeah. Oh, you'll find I don't like info dumps. I don't think I put very many in any of my books, but I like for my books to have good rereadability. So especially after you read book two, because it answers a lot of the questions are going to happen book one. So if you go back and you reread book one after two, that you'll understand stuff so much better. And you'll see all these little things that you that are so obvious, but you don't notice them or you don't even think about them right now. So that's kind of things kind of seem sort of why is she doing that? Or why is this here? This doesn't make sense. But by book five, six, it'll all come together and it all will kind of just flow. So I don't know if it's a good idea because people might be like, book one, like, why are they doing this? They never talk to them again. They never go back here again. But it makes sense. I got a, I got a plan. I promise. I mean, I think that for people who don't like that writing style, then this book probably isn't for them. And you know what? That's fine. But there are plenty of people out there that just want a good story. So whether that is given to them in info dumps or whether that is just like they get to piece like puzzle piece like things together and they enjoy it so much that they read it again and just all of the, the immense foreshadowing that they're like, oh, my God, I was so wrong about, you know, just makes it that much better. One of the other things that I really enjoyed in this this chapter is when Gil is kind of like that they're all here because they trust her. Just, I really, I'm really digging like the blind loyalty and not that like, it sounds like a bad term, but again, I'm sure that there's more to the friendship that equals that loyalty and just the sense of companionship you get from Gil and Lork, even though they're vastly different in personalities uh, how much they they really seem to want to assist near in any way poss- in any way shape possible uh, so that she can achieve her goal even even though that's as cloudy that's still pretty cloudy for us but just they're willing to go to the ends of the earth for her and I just I enjoyed that companionship nothing to add for you there buddy I said I don't know if you want me to respond every time I don't feel like I, I should so <laughs> no not at all it's definitely okay. you know, it's a uh, Derek can respond. You can respond. If this, these are just things okay. that, like I found as cool. You could just sit there in awkward silence, and I'll eventually move on. Like, 
<laughs> all of that just gets cut out anyway. So okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have anything to add to what you said there. I think that was well said. Yeah. The other thing that I thought was really really cool in this section is she there was a moment where she was just like well what are the chances that they were transported to the doorstep of an ancient magical cave and i'm just like okay i'm going back to the you know the end of the first chapter and even pockets of the second chapter where she's basically transporting herself and going back to the first chapter where she was just so disappointed that the aaron had this enchantment on it that is it possible that near unintentionally or like subconsciously brought them to Vleland? Is it subconsciously possible that she needed this cave before she knew she needed this cave? That's a pretty cool theory. I won't be commenting on it, but <laughs> I <course>. like it. <laughs> Eric, do you have thoughts? Uh, I think to me, it, it, uh, it reminds me a little bit of, what was it? Was it the green man in the eye of the world where it shows up when you need it? I can't remember exactly what it was in the real time. That's what I think of a little bit. So maybe, I don't know. Well, we do know that Nier believes in fate. So, I mean, it could have been fate. It could have been her subconsciously going somewhere. It could have been completely random and she just wound up thrown somewhere because Leland is right, behind, right underneath Lynn. So it's very close to where she was trying to go anyway. She just couldn't get there. It was close to where she was, too, in chapter one. I like that interpretation. The world may never know. The world may never know. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Cool. I always think it's a little interesting how, like, fate and religion seem to be kind of two hands, you know, to the same person, I guess. Um, I mean, you can see it one way or the other, but they seem to just interlace to, to some extent, I feel like. So, intervention. Yeah, and I, I mean, I mean, for myself, I mean, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I mean, even going back to my deal with the car, like, I mean, was it just luck, or was there a little bit of fate there? You know, I don't know. It's, things it makes you think about things. Yeah, it definitely does. And is is fate rewarding the pure of heart versus the not pure of heart? Like. Is fate in some way judging your character and your actions? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I try not to be a douchebag, but I feel like overall I'm a nice dude. But If you are, it was fated, so you can't fight it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all because I can't pronounce words right. That's right. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen you be mean to anybody, Justin. I had my moments where I was a jerk in college. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. I think the important part is that I've learned from them. Um, so HC, I know that you had a, a thought here. Is this something that you intended for me to read or is this something you wanted to say? <laughs> so she rummaged through the drawers and found a blue book marked by gold trim symbols. She used her magic to help her read the book. And the book's title was Magical Runes. So someone commented um, and actually kind of got caught out on a little bit. So I wanted to comment on it as well. Um, that Nier hasn't been able to practice or use her magic, which is stated very early on in the book, but she is still fully capable of using it anyway. And she seems pretty good at it. Um, that is because she is, and it was done on purpose. Um, Yes, it is, I guess, sort of thought convenient, but I didn't really want a coming of age story and I didn't really want her to have to struggle with her magic from the beginning of the series where you're going to have to watch her learn how to use it and she's really weak and she doesn't understand. She does still use her sword a lot. She does still fight physically a lot, but... Um, I really like to leave things open-ended for the readers to kind of have their own theories or piece things together. Um, so you kind of have to have your own interpretation, I suppose, of why. Because for me, um, you know, you learn about her history. I don't know if it's been mentioned yet, but, um, you know, she's with the Brotherhood. And she's had a lot of training and a lot of um, schooling 
with them. So she knows about magic. She knows how to use magic in terms of studying it. So for me, when she uses it here, she's still very weak. It still almost kills her. She can't really do it a lot. Um, but I think instinct kind of takes over in situations where it's do or die. So that is why in the beginning of the book, yeah, she can't really use it. The order pursues her, pursues her when she uses it. But if she has to, then she can. And as we can see, there's a lot of dire consequences that come from using it. I told you I ramble. <laughs> Fine. Don't worry. We are not under any time constraint. It is what it is. This will be an interesting uh, episode to edit. That's all I'm going to say. Um, I know I felt like in those first two chapters, it felt like she was doing a lot with her magic, even though she thought she wasn't. So I'm like, well, it kind of seems like it. And uh, yeah. So just to know, I guess that she, I mean, she's had, had experience, but you know, she just doesn't have a lot of time or, or ways to practice it without repercussions. Makes sense. Which yeah. I would assume makes her really weak as far as like strength of magic she's not it's not like she doesn't know how to do it she's not struggling to figure it out she knows how to do it she just doesn't want to be figured out yeah and i mean as we've seen um in some of the scenes she gets really really weak it kind of exerts a lot of energy and it makes her very weak when she uses it and she only throughout the book can use like two or three spells. Like she really doesn't know how to do a lot of stuff. So she's using the same stuff over and over again. Cause it's really the only things she uses force fields a lot. Even when she was fighting in book chapter two, I think against the, the Dren, she's using force fields like the whole time. So she knows very, very basic stuff. Okay. So the strength of her magic isn't weak. It just makes her weak to use it. Mm, I mean, so it's hard to explain, I guess. Like, say it's like a balloon. Yeah. So you have this amount of energy. So she can use it all and it would be strong, but then she'd run out very quickly. So, yeah, she doesn't have a lot of energy to use. So she can exert a lot of it and it'll be strong or she can do smaller bursts of it and they will be a little weaker, but she can do it more. But she runs out very fast. And then the, the I guess, how it affects her is much worse because it's not as strong as it should be. She's overexerting herself. Okay. So is it kind of like, you know, someone training, you know, like strength training or even just endurance training, you know, when you first start out, you are definitely not at a point where you can run as for as far as you could six months from now. It's a capacity that as you practice, you get better at it. But because there are consequences to practicing, she can't ever get better at it. Right. It's kind of like in, in the second chapter when she teleports, she passes out and she passes out long enough that vines have started to grow over her and she's on the ground for a long time. And she's really weak when she stands up and then she finds Gil soon after and she heals him and she passes out again because she's overexerted herself again. She can't even stay awake. So it's kind of she's very weak when she uses it. She does use it a lot, though, and I, I will I will agree with that. I will accept that criticism. I know, <laughs> but it was sort of done on purpose. I probably did it a little too much, but you know, you you live and you learn. <laughs> That's fair, but still, it's it's an it's an interesting dynamic that Nier has to like inside of her head. She's just like, well, fuck, I don't want to be found out, but I'm in this situation where like. I'm overwhelmed, and this is the one thing that'll, like, even the playing field. So, that, like, risk versus reward type thing. I can only imagine uh, how fucking confused she is. This poor girl. <laughs> right. Uh, so, the other the other thought that I had was with the tree and all. That was one that you wrote down. You can unwrite it down now. <laughs> The pronunciation guide, people. The pronunciation guide. Right. Where do you where do you have these written down? Because I'm not. Where where am I supposed to be looking? Oh no, I wrote them down to call him out on them. <laughs> so he told me to oh, mark well, off my list. I'm fixing them as I'm going through it. Yeah, he said that oh, one right okay. this time. <laughs> Dream doll, not Michelle, and I'm real. Uh, yep. So 
it says or so like when she's reading the book uh it says that there you know it says or so it says triandel or the trials of blood so are there two ways to dispel the mark for the a rune yep so they're not one and the same right okay because the prefix the whole trian makes me relate this to like oh yeah diversity <laughs> and strength as explained in the book of blood or the trials of blood so so like there isn't a relation there are two definite things going on there there's two different things the tree and all are a race gotcha and they actually come up you meet them in the banished novella um so they you know they're part of the lore but the tree and all is like a race and then the trials of blood is a trial that you have to go through and i mean the tree and all really isn't explained you I just, I really don't explain what that is. I kind of wanted to leave it a mystery, but I just literally told you. But uh, yeah, so they're completely different. Gotcha. So is The Banished something that is not in this book? The Banished is a novella. Oh, okay. So that happens before. Get it together, Justin. Fuck you. <laughs> it's Curse there, of the Fallen. There he is being a jerk again. <laughs> yeah. It's Curse of the Fallen and then The Forbidden Realms and then The Banished is the novella um after book two before book three gotcha okay all right you said coming up so i was just like gotcha it's not coming up for us because it takes us a long time to get through a book oh i don't remember saying that sorry <laughs> no it's all good that's why i asked <laughs> and then Derek called me a jerk so it's fine <laughs> legitimate question here being chastised used to it throwing me in the- yeah, I got sort of to explain something that i don't even explain in the book it really isn't a spoiler though because it is what it is like the tree and doll are just part of the world they're part of the lore um and yeah it's just a race so they could go there you'll find out near has no idea what they are gil doesn't know what they are um but yeah it's two separate things like i said okay cool well i'm glad that i was able to pick that out then yeah i, was, I didn't even realize that like the the prefix of the words were the same, so it could even kind of be confusing. That's what I thought, but yeah, it's all good. Uh, that's just me, like, hyper-focusing on shit. I don't know. No, that's good, because like I said, sorry, I was interrupting you. <laughs> no, I was done. You were just conveniently picking off as soon as I ended. <laughs> um, it's good, though. I like that, because that's kind of how you need to read the books because I put a lot of little things like that. So that really could have been something that I would have snuck in there that later on you'd be like, that's why it's like that. This in this case, it isn't, but I like the way you're thinking. Okay. That's kind of the way I wrote. So. All right. Fair, fair. So uh, my next thought was surrounding the uh, releasing of the enchantment for the mark. So if I'm understanding this correctly, near needs to journey to uh Namashell to either complete this triandal or trials of blood well it's not complete the triandal anymore i wrote this before you, ex- okay. <laughs> you explained everything so i guess to update it so she either needs to journey to Namashell and either talk to this race of triandals or complete the trials of blood just to release the enchantment from the a rune so she can utilize the magic within the a rune that way she can exact her revenge against the order of sorrow yes sort of she can either take it to the tree and all she doesn't know what they are she doesn't know where they are yeah. so according to this ancient book because the tree and all may not even exist i mean this is a book that belongs to the enclave who are no longer around so she can take it to the tree and all or she can go through the trials of blood to get to the cave of Nama show. And in the cave, we'll have the way that she can dispel the mark. By going in the water, right? And I'm yes. I mark. wasn't sure if that was mentioned. Yeah. Yes. So the waters of Nama Shell will allow her to open it. It will dispel the mark and she can use the magic to dispel her own curse. So it almost kind of, it does make sense that you didn't have any explanation of the, the tree and doll because what's there to explain if they're a race of scholars or they're a race of of people who know how to dispel the enchantment right okay that makes a lot of sense got it yeah 
yeah. the main characters don't know and it's in an ancient book and like i said you do find out what they are or who they are later in the series but there really is no purpose to know what they are in this book so i kind of leave it open-ended like it's a mystery got it um and speaking of the the Aaron, and it was said that is a one-time use of magic so is it one of those things where like can she use it limits limitlessly until she stopped or is it just like I can use it once on anything I want, or I have this power until I no longer have it. It's just basically like a pocket of extremely powerful energy. So she can save it. And once she uses it, that's it. It won't give her unlimited energy. Basically it's like using a spell so she can take that energy, absorb it, do what she needs to do with it. And then the energy has gone. Got it. Okay. All right, again, just me thinking way too deeply about stuff. Oh, that's a good question. Um, and then the other thing, the last thing that I had is at the very end of the chapter, she's just like, I'm going to go to the trials of blood and lift the curse for good. And I'm like, okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, her magic abilities so that she'll no longer be hunted down is she going to face the trial so she can remove the enchantment of the mark and then use the one time use Aaron to dispel her ability to harness magic so she becomes a normal person? Yeah, so she's not dispelling her magic. She's dispelling the curse that ties her to the order because every time she uses her magic, they can track her down. So she does not want to get rid of her magic. She just wants to stop the order from being able to track her. Got it. I thought, okay, that makes more sense now. I don't know how I missed the whole curse thing then. Is that what you were thinking, Derek? Did I write this wrong? Oh, no. <laughs> Am I confusing everybody? I, I'm just wondering now, like, if she's in Vleland, where it's all dangerous and stuff, and if she's using her magic there, are they going to track her down there? Like, couldn't she just kind of use that as a, like, guerrilla tactic to take out the order? Like, I'm going to use my magic and lure you here, and you're going to get murdered by some Dren or whatever else, Nyx and... I don't we don't even know what else could be there yet but um just uh dwindle their numbers over time yeah fair enough uh that was that was all my thoughts uh on this really kind of cool chapter I love the omniance I love the presence of the characters the whole cold chill running through like near like that just made me think of like I don't know when you have those moments where like you know, the hair on the back of your neck stands up and like on your arms uh, just kind of got a really cool sense of like horror, horror there. But yeah, that was, yeah, it was a cool chapter. I'm wanting to know more for sure. You will by the end of the series. Yes. <laughs> of course. Don't count on, don't count on getting all the answers in book one. Cause Oh, I know. Well, then if we did, why would you need to write more books? Then? Exactly. People complain to me about that. And I'm like, it's book one, please. <laughs> I'm not going to answer everything. All right. So before we move on, <clears throat> you mispronounced one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words. A rune, not a rune. And uh, Ebard, not Ebard, which is fine because it is spelled Ebard. But I, Ebard is actually just the word bard. And I put an EB in front of it because I couldn't think of a word, like a stage name for him. And it just stayed because I thought it was kind of clever. Gotcha. And then Ryman. Uh, Ryman. Oh, yeah. Which is my fault because I did spell it like Ryman. For and then Zafalindel is the name of the book, but that doesn't really matter. Yeah, just... I was just going off its interpretation. <laughs> that one, um, I'm still going to mark you off for it because I want to. <laughs> All right. Well, sounds good. <laughs> all right derek your turn have fun i will fate is not determined by the gods or the star but by those who are willing to seek change master ryman chapter four in fate's hands near woke up earlier than the others and found her way back to the library spending hours trying to find and learn anything she could on the trials and aaron though she had found little on either Taking a break from her research and reading, she stepped into the waters of the moat surrounding the stalactites. As she floated on her back and looked up in the small opening, she, she could see lightning flashing across the sky and wondered when the storm would let up. 
She knew from her research that Vleland was a land cursed with rain and clouds because Nix could not survive without moisture and shade. Cleansing her mind, she submerged herself and scrubbed herself clean. She broke the surface of the water and, and inhaled a deep breath. The pain in her shoulder was gone, and as she cautiously unwrapped the bandage, she saw a pink scar in place of the gaping wound. Near touched it, confused at the rapid healing. Lork and Gil were at the side of the pool. Lork questioned her. What do you think you're doing? We should be getting out of here. She made herself to the edge of the pool. I was just waiting for you knuckleheads to wake. If you would have woken me, we could have left before this nasty storm hit. We couldn't. We can't travel in such a mess. She asked. Doesn't it always storm in Vleland? Gil gave an answer. Not always. Seems important, my son. Would be smart to wait out such a nasty storm. Deer pushed herself back out into the water and said, It's settled then. We wait out the storm and then we'll head home. Sounding more excited than nervous, Lark said, If you say so. Taking off his pants and jacket, he jumped into the water. Near asked if Gil was coming in. He replied, Go ahead, and I'll get out swimming. We sink like fresh pile of shite. Lark responded, saying, Right, but some shite floats, Gilly, as he spat some water towards Gil. Gil moved out of the way with a scowl and clenched his fist. Chuckling, Near said, All right, just sit on the edge, Gil. Don't exclude yourself from the fun. Lork pulled Near underwater, rubbed her head. She pushed him away and surfaced, waiting for Lork to break the water so she could splash him. When he came up, she could see he was messing with his clothes and asking, Why is the water so tingly and warm? Near was surprised and said, What? As she moved her arms through the water, noticing the sensation, but also realizing it was normal to her. It feels like magic. She said, Magic? What are you going on about? Lork asked. She told him that what he was feeling is what it feels when she prepares to use magic or meditated. It feels warm and tingly, tingly, then becomes unbearable. She wondered if that's why her shoulder had healed. Lork was surprised and got himself out of the water, saying that saying that it couldn't be magic and that was foolish. How could magic be swirling in the water? Gil responded, saying it actually could. It could be enchantments in the cave soaking into it. Near spoke up. It could be the divines. Lork got a little worked up, saying, the divines aren't real. Don't go spouting off that nonsense, Nirana. You sound like a right good prude, Near rebutted. The divines are creatures of magic. And we know magical energy exists. What's to say the divines don't exist too? Lork all worked up. Because they just don't. It's just another way for the Order to keep control of the country. They have us all thinking that magic is something evil and that you're just child of Nizadl himself. Honestly, Nier, I figured at least of all you'd be following the divines. If anyone in the Brotherhood found out, Raymond would never hear the end of it. Nier turned in shame. Though she was not angry since she could not since she really couldn't be, Lork's passion wasn't completely misplaced. It was part of Bob's mission to dismantle the Order of Sorrow renounce the, and renounce the Divines. Her adoptive father, Master Ryman, was the founding mem member of Bob. And if any of the members found out about her beliefs, it would cripple all the honor her father had built over the years. Gil broke a long silence and asked where she went in the wee hours of the morning. Lork wanted to know what she was going on, wanted to know what was going on, and hoped Nier wasn't off exploring the caves on her own. She said she had found a library and had learned something useful. Mark enchantments can be lifted from an errand. She asked if they had heard of a triangle. Neither of the other two had heard of what she was talking about. She continued. If we can't find it, my only option of dispelling the mark and harnessing the energy in the Arun is to go through the trials of blood. Lork asked how she knew that. She said she read it in a book about enchanted runes. You can read Elvish now? asked Lork. There's more to me than meets the eye, Ebbard. Nier replied. Gil said it sounded dangerous, and he had never heard of such a place. Nier told them, There was a map to a cave called Namashel. It's very deep within Eni Maril. The entrance is along the wetlands bordering Vleland and Lynn. I'll accompany you two out of Vleland and then head to the cave alone. Lork shouted, What? Not a chance. We aren't leaving you behind here. She pleaded. It's too dangerous, Lorik. Surviving Velen is hard enough for a sorceress, and the trials are even worse. Lork told her she shouldn't go alone. Near, 
still pleading, begged them. I can't risk your lives. Please, just this once, don't argue with me. Nier knew he wanted to press the issue further, but was glad he didn't. Looking through the cave, her eyes were drawn to the tree with its tall branches and glowing flowers. Her eyes followed as petals drifted to the ground. Nier asked if this was a tree like in Porster. Stroking his beard, he said, Looks like we got the same glowing flowers and such. Nier stepped to the tree, drew breath, and all was still. The tingle of magic flowed through her. She touched the tree and was filled with warmth and power. With each breath she took in, the leaves glowed brighter. Exhaled, they dimmed. She thought about the only other tree like this that she knew. They behaved the same way. Back in her home of Porzder, back when the world was a simpler place for her, it was a recent development that the Order had begun attacking villages looking for her. Rivers of blood and mass graves would never be erased from her memory. Bodies laying in an open field after the knights of the Order ravaged a farming village in Stir that had heard a rumor of a sorceress's whereabouts. Her whereabouts. She had never been to this village before, not until after the attack. Then she and Bob had shown up to pay respect. Gil asked Lork what he was doing, and he said he was rationing his food. Gil was surprised and said he had had food this whole time and didn't tell anyone. He said he didn't think they'd be stuck in a cave for days. Near, frustrated, closed her eyes and thought if she had a coin for every time they fought, she could hire an assassin to go on this journey for them. She smiled and thought she would remember that for the next time. She interjected and told him to give them all the food. Digging through a beautiful satchel caused Gil and Nier to share a confused look. Gil asked, What you got there, lad? Lark said, It's a satchel. Nier replied, We know that, but where did you get it? Lark told them, Found it in a chest by the bed. Why? Gil, slightly irritated, said, You shouldn't go taking things that don't belong to you. Defensively, Lark said, and who exactly does it belong to? Unless you're saying the Enclave are going to rise up from the ashes and demand a return their fancy wares. Gil slapped back. Fine. Take what you will. No one's stopping you anyhow. Snobbishly, Lorik said that that was right. He split up what was left of the food and said that's what they had left. Dismayed, Gil said, and holding his hungry stomach. I haven't had a good meal since the missus struck down that cow. With her bare hands. Ho ho! It was a sight to be seen. Lorik, feeling spicy, decided to talk some shit. Like else she did. You're no bigger than my left arm. Couldn't have done her all by her lonesome. Gil simply told him that maybe his wife wasn't a drillid. Near said she needed to meet his wife. She knew he kept his family secret as he understood the danger he put them in with his involvement with Bob. He didn't want any acts of revenge exacted on his family. They started a campfire and ate dinner. Near asked when they might be able to leave the cave. Gil said as soon as the storm cleared, they would head for Lynn. She asked if he knew where in Vlen the cave was. He said no, he had no idea, as he hadn't seen any markers. And finding the cave was truly a gift, as it had been, as if they had been stuck out in the storm, it would have been the end of them. Lord jumped in. A gift? From who? The divines? Don't tell me you follow the old ways, Gil. Gil told him to mind his own business, as he had been alive for longer than him, and the six had been around for decades longer than that. You can't argue with the divine's teachings. Lork asked if he knew what the order had done. Gil said that he didn't say he followed the order, and those pious fucks can choke on goat horns. Near told him to settle down. She knew he would get all worked up. He told Lork to get a cauldron and go get some water. Pointing at the moat, he asked if they wanted to drink that magic juice. Gil told him to fill it with rainwater. He did as he was told. Gil and Near took a few minutes took in the few minutes of silence and peace while he ran the errand. When he returned, he said he found an ocarina. She remembered the instrument that, when used, compelled others to dance if they were within earshot. She wasn't very sad when she found it was smashed to pieces one morning. Gil gave him a piece of his mind, saying he shouldn't be digging through that garbage, and he still hadn't brought any water back. He told Gil to chill and said he'd get, get on it, 
and then blew into the ocarina. Nothing happened, and he set it aside, saying it was worth a try and pulled out a loot. Gil was surprised and said he needed to quit stealing. Lark said it's not stealing if there's no one to own it. Gil threw up his arms in defeat, no longer seeing the point in arguing. He played a song, and it brought Nier back to simpler times. They shared a moment, and Lark Garrett gave Nier a wink. Gil caught it and teased them, saying he could slap the googly eyes right off their faces. Lark ended the song and clearly offended. Nier told him to take it easy. It was just a joke. Still defensive, he asked Nier if she was the queen of the jesters. Gil was rolling in laughter, saying he should be spouting this on stage instead of singing it. Nier diffused the situation, and Lark asked when they were getting out of here. Nier said soon and asked Gil if there was another way out of the cave, as it was too risky to go the way they had come. He said he wasn't sure, but it wasn't wise to wander too far. Hard to say what kind of trouble they might find just by being there. Nier asked if this place belonged to the Enclave. What happened to them? Gil said no one knew. They just up and disappeared, left everything behind. Not a trace left except these caves and what was left inside. She asked if he thought they were still alive. Lark interrupted and said they shouldn't talk about that. Bad enough they're stuck in a cave in Nick's territory. Last thing they need is some ghosts coming to haunt them. Teasing, Nier asked if he was scared. He said no, he was just ready to go home. Gil had a plan to transmogrify into a horse and carry them out across Vleland. Something made a noise not far away. Nier turned to look for it while the others stayed as they were, seemingly unaware of the noise. She grabbed her sword. Lork asked what she was doing. Nier spoke up. Did you hear that? Lork answered her. Hear what? Don't be jesting at a time like this. Nier hissed. Quiet. She studied the room as the hair on her raised and her heart beat into her throat. From the cave entrance, they heard the sound of a sword being unsheathed. Nier assumed a defensive position while Lork cowered behind and Gil turned into a dren, stepping next to Nier. She watched the entrance as three shadow blades emerged from the darkness. Ooh. Well, that was fun, guys. Yeah, sorry I butchered that to shit. <laughs> it was great. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> you actually did really good. You did much better than I could have ever done. <laughs> I don't think there was any consistency there, but I'll take it. Thank you. Yeah, no, Gil is hard. I can't even get his voice in my head right. He just sounds like a normal scottish dwarf in my head and that's not how he's supposed to sound i wrote him in a way that i can't even envision <laughs> huh. well maybe it'll work then <laughs> it'll work it's fine <laughs> <laughs> it's passable yeah. no that was a lot of fun i had a lot of fun doing that uh and just kind of alternating off like that it, it just makes it feel a little bit more alive to me as we're reading it yeah i like it i wonder if um if we keep doing it like if listeners or viewers or anything like that we could take out the dialogue tags and we could just kind of bounce the dialogue back and forth off of each other to kind of make it more immersive that could work too instead of having to pause to say she said and he said sure i mean all that's gonna be edited out so it'll it'll flow seamlessly yeah 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 i forget we're editing this or we you (laughs) justin yeah justin does a lot of work with this so um, yeah, I, I'm very thankful for what he does. I come up with these ideas sometimes and then he, he makes it work. So it's, <laughs> I feel like it's a, it's a little heavy on his end most of the time. I don't come up with ideas, so you're fine. <laughs> I'm just along for the ride. I just make your lives harder. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> nah, um, it's fun. You might, you might notice that. I don't usually have as many comments on things like Justin does. Um, I might have a few and then I'll pitch them to Justin and then just kind of feed off of him. Or sometimes I just go more with the flow of things, but I I don't feel like it's too often where I'll have such a strong thought on like the epigraph, but that this one for chapter four, just really kind of struck with me. Um, for one, it made me think of the quote, and I don't remember who said it, but it was something to the effect of the harder I work, the luckier, the luckier I am, or I become. And sometimes that's what I think fate is, you know, if you just kind of work hard for 
what you want and, and it'll work out, I guess. Um, kind of like you determine your own fate in a way. Like, yeah. Actions always follow the thought. I didn't hear what you said, Justin. I'm sorry. What was oh, that? like actions always follow the thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was just from, I mean, that based on the last chapter, I mean, we, I feel like Lork's kind of the odd one out where he doesn't really believe in the gods and fate and everything, at least not like the other two. Well, That's kind of where my thought ended there. Oh, but sorry. I, I get the sense that Gil and Nier kind of believe more in the divines prior to the Order of Sorrow fucking it up. Whereas Lork is just like, you know, like, fuck it all. I make my own, forge my own way kind of thing. And it just like Lork seems a little bit of, I don't want to say like an outsider or anything like that, but he, he seems maybe, I guess, less convinced on things as far as like involving the gods, fate, um, or maybe just religion as a whole. He feels like he's more of a like, he needs to see it to believe it type of guy. Yeah, and you get a better understanding of what they really think and what they believe and why they believe the things that they believe as the story goes on, too. So I don't really want to comment too much because it gets kind of into their, you know, spoiler, I guess, territory. Um, but yeah, I like I like the wheels are turning a little bit. And I sure. feel like that was probably your intended design, right, is to get the wheels turning. I mean, always. <laughs> of course. It keeps you interested. <laughs> like, why? Why is he like this? And But the other two aren't. Like, does the Brotherhood believe in this stuff? Do they not? Are they against it? Are they not? Do they just want to get rid of the Order? Do they want to get rid of all of it? Well, I feel like I feel like the Order is probably similar to Gil and Nier in that they, they believe the Divines, but don't necessarily believe what the Order of Sorrow is trying to convince people about the Divines. Because there were seven, right? There were seven divines, and they kicked the Order of Sorrow just decided to kick one out. I don't remember the reason why off the top of my head. Yep. I don't know if it's mentioned why yet. It might be. But yeah, the old ways have seven gods that were in the teachings, and the new ways, which is the current uh, belief system, um, one of the divines is no longer able to be followed. They have deemed this divine bad i suppose and they just don't want anybody to ever follow anything that they said is this divine potentially around magic uh I'm i thought it was the one around death or i don't remember but that was sticking out at me for some reason i don't know if it said i feel like we were told but i don't remember i think i have the book right here it was the one that started with an n right nizzle no nizzle nizzle and this may be in a footnote. I don't think that would have been particularly in the uh, exposition. Because it really isn't super important to like the plot or anything. It's just more like lore, I guess. But I'm pulling up my manuscript, so let's oh, see. Oh, yeah. I just cast another as the purveyor of darkness and evil. That abolished one of the seven divines and cast another as the purveyor of darkness and evil. So I'm just going to go with that. So that makes sense. But yeah, I mean, that that's all super interesting. I like want to know more about that. Whoever was abolished, like, is it one of those things where now that there are, now that there's no more preaching for this divine, do they just like simply fade away because there's no one, there's less and less believers? Is the strength of this divine like weakened because there's no more following or less following? Yeah, I'm just curious of all of the world building around that. That would be super cool. And if you um, if you look at the map, you can see where the, the temples for these divines are, and some of them are in ruins. So that may give you a so, sort of a hint. May not. And then you can also see, too, there's um, little symbols next to it. And I never, I, I meant to make a, uh, a guide, like a table guide, but you have this Order of Sorrow symbol, you have the Broken Order Brotherhood symbol, and then the one with the cross swords is the um, Shadow Blades symbol. So the symbol represents kind of what their claim is of the temple or the city or whatever. Um, so it's laid out there for you. 
My, I don't know. I, I mean, I bought I bought the paperback version from Amazon, and I feel like the uh, images are like really pixelated. Pixelated? Yeah, it's like really fuzzy. And like, oh you know, no, that should not be right because mine is not pixelated at all. Is yours, there? I I just have the collectors special edition. Yeah, the collectors edition. I didn't, but but yeah, it's clear on mine. Yeah, yours should not. I'll have to send you another one. I mean, I don't know how much you care about the map, but that should not be pixelated. Yeah, like all of the trees and like the swords that you're talking about with like the circle. You can barely see the circle. They just oh. pixels. Oh my gosh. How long ago did you get that book? I I don't know. I bought it from Amazon like I don't know, two or three months ago, maybe. Sometime before we started this. Okay, maybe. that is not right. I'm weird about my books. I don't want to read the good ones. I'll buy one that I can like fuck up. No, I get that. I I'm sorry. That should not have been pixelated, and I really hate that. That's fine. It's no big deal. Oh, it's a big deal to me. <laughs> I don't like that. Now I'm gonna have to go back and figure out what the heck is going on. I'm gonna have to order some. Um, one of my other thoughts here on this chapter. Nier's got her quote saying that the divines are the creators of magic. We know magical energy exists. What's to say the divines don't exist too? And to me, it just seemed odd, like, okay, well, you know magical energy exists and the divines are the creators of magic. Well, to me, just based on that statement seems to prove that the divines do exist. And again, not being a very religious person, it just seems almost contradictory contradict if i'm saying that word right <laughs> uh you know to say otherwise well she is talking to loric who says that the divines don't exist at all and she's like well magic exists and the divines are the creators of magic so how can you say that the divines don't exist if magic exists is kind of her argument to him gotcha yeah well, maybe that in that context it makes more make, makes more sense then because that kind of felt like i mean i mean she believes that they must exist i guess i don't know that they do or don't but obviously the magic exists well right yeah I mean, it just seemed sorry. like an odd statement to me but i guess i didn't put it together in that context that she's using it as a argument i mean honestly whenever i read your comment too i didn't really think of it either until we reread through it and i was like okay well this is an argument i just read the one sentence so i was like yeah i get what you're saying here but yeah and in this in this argument to me too it feels like she's more goading him than trying to convince him that's how you know i read it you have your own interpretation though i almost kind of get the sense that like lork is kind of like the dumb one in the group you know yeah. like he's not as you know how like every group of friends has like that one that's like the stupid one you know <laughs> and not that i don't know what that is what is that it's me justin it's me in this group oh sad, oh, sad. <laughs> how dare you Lork, um, I wouldn't really say Lork is stupid because even in the um, the last chapter, he was the one that was trying to convince Nier, hey, this is not a good idea. You can't go wandering around. You can't be reckless here. You have to be vigilant. You know, he's trying to keep her head on straight, but at the same time, he's a little more, what's a good word? <laughs> not stupid, but very kind of airheaded at times, I suppose, if you want to say that. Just very not airheaded just very carefree just kind of right. whatever happens happens doesn't think too deep about things i guess you know doesn't try to like see a, a step loop. ahead he just kind of lives in the moment sure and you know i'm not trying to say that lork is stupid or dumb i didn't have any i just couldn't think of any better words for yeah. it. <laughs> but he seems like the one where i could see maybe near and gilf like maybe feeling a little bit like above or better then Lork, just because he has such a, a vastly different mindset than they do. And I know that at one point in one of these chapters, I can't recall which, uh, Lork and uh, Nier had their their friendship didn't start off very well because of the dy dynamics of, did I miss, am I making that up? I feel like I read that somewhere. Uh I don't recall that, but maybe that is written in there. It's been a while. It's not in my head that they ever had issues, but I could be misremembering my own work. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> maybe it's something from like the first or second chapter. I 
I don't know. Well, never mind them. <laughs> Ignore that. But yeah, I just, I mean, like, I like, I like the companionship and the camaraderie, but I almost feel like, like, Lorik eventually would get tired of being teased or like picked on for the way that he thinks. Uh, so I could kind of maybe see some tension there that maybe Lorik is just like, eh, whatever. I'll take it. But I feel like inside he's brewing. I don't know. He seems to really let it out with Gil, at least. They kind of go back and forth a lot. <laughs> they don't really hold back. <laughs> yes, yes, they definitely do. And I almost kind of wonder, like, is it the same type of relationship that Lork has with Nier and, like, Gil has with Nier? Or is this just like, a, oh, he's along for the ride, so I'll just be cordial? Green find out. There's our first Rafo. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my other thoughts here. I was pretty sure I remembered reading that the, the trees with a capital T, they don't lose their leaves or flowers was that correct from one of the i Mm -hmm. I thought about rereading uh all four chapters i just this week i just didn't have time it Um, actually in my footnote sorry i don't mean to interrupt you no you're fine so it was somewhere okay yeah you're right and i had to go back and read that because i was like hmm because i see the discrepancy there but i'm smarter than i thought because it may or may not be intentional I, I'm assuming it. There must be a reason then that something's something's changing in the land. Like the divines are dying because no one believes in them. Oh, there are plenty of people that believe in them. Just, Justin, you're just going full on dark here. Yep. Yeah, it says in a footnote: "Tree is a term used for the large, glowing trees that are found throughout the continent of Laeroth. The origin of the trees are unknown." though they are believed to hold powerful magical energy and even the harshest of climates and even in the harshest of climates, they never lose their glowing flowers or or leaves. But as we can see here, they are drifting away and near does not think about it. So it can either just be that that is just a belief that they can live wherever and they never die. Or it could also mean that something is causing them to die and the, the characters just don't notice it. Hmm. Well, is it fate that Nier is there and its leaves are falling? Mm-hmm. Maybe there's something there. I don't know, but see, that's what I, that's why I said it's really good that you notice things like that because little tiny things are sprinkled all throughout and that could mean something. It could mean nothing. I'll have to find out. Mm-hmm. I just said magic is dying. <laughs> Nier's just soaking it all up. Now that she's using it, she's taking it all. Nier is the missing piece. Ooh. She is the god. Yes, she is the seventh divine. We can find out. My my next comment here was just kind of for you, Justin. It was a uh, reference to Malazan. Oh, yeah, your transmorgify. No, not even that. Oh. Drew breath and all was, drew breath and all was still. I added a few uh, words there because that's not exactly how it was worded. Now I get um, it. Yep. And just more pie shit. Thanks, man. <laughs> Uh, sorry it's not really an inside joke it's just uh i I took an opportunity there that's all yes you did you took a pie tunity (laughs) the mike full scott gif i love inside jokes i want to be a part of one someday (laughs) (laughs) i'm sure we'll form some (laughs) uh i think i said Steyer wrong when I read it. I knew I remembered seeing your uh, note on the side, and then I couldn't remember as I was reading, and I couldn't see it, so I kind of panicked a little bit. Yeah, it's Steyer like Spire. You mispronounced four words, but to be fair, there weren't as many foreign words in your chapter. Ah, fuck. <laughs> well, I still did better than Justin. Yeah, you said Llewellyn, right? <laughs> yeah, because you learned. You still said a rune wrong, though. <laughs> did I? Damn yeah, it. And I definitely am. Um, Taught you that one. Uh, Arun. Earned that one. Ah. Arun. Well, hopefully I'll remember. It's okay. Um, man, Lorkin, he's finding all this shit. Like, finding slash stealing. <laughs> Ocarinas, loots. I mean, he's just finding all the cool stuff. He's supposed to go get water, and he's just like, look what I found. Yeah, but wasn't he just the previous chapter being all like, we shouldn't go exploring. 
and then got like real butthurt about it and then like stormed out of the room because yeah. you know so it's just like i mean i guess if anything it just goes to show that he was adapted and got comfortable real quick i guess <laughs> um, yeah he found this um the satchel and it's like all i think it's all like bejeweled and stuff i can't really remember exactly but he found the satchel and he doesn't really do anything with it but my plan at first and what actually it was in the first draft was um like a bag of holding from dungeons and dragons which is basically just an infinite like an endless bag you can put whatever you want in it but it looks like a satchel but I kept thinking about that and I was like, that feels a little too magic-y and it feels way too convenient because I am very aware that a lot of convenient things happen in my book, Um, at least in terms of like healing and where they wind up because it's very fast paced. I don't put a lot of like exposition and filler. So everything feels more convenient because I don't like draw it out between like the events. So I decided to take that out because it just felt... It felt a little too much to me, but that was the whole plan with that satchel. It was supposed to actually be like a, a useful satchel, not just something he stole. So he's uh, part bard, part thief then. I guess so. Although, I mean, is it really stealing? You never know. Nobody lives there. This game has been abandoned for like years. I mean, it's still it's still stealing. It still doesn't belong to him, even oh, if yeah. they're not there, right? Well, yeah, I'm just going by Lorik's logic. I don't know if he would really go into someone's house and take something, but it seems like he's perfectly fine with looting empty houses and looting things off of out of places where other people don't belong, I suppose. I mean, I probably would. Like, I mean, if it appears abandoned, then it's just free game, I think. So Someone else I don't blame him. <laughs> um, I think that was about it. That as far as things that I had, yeah, I didn't remember the shadow blades being mentioned before in chapter one. And I may not have even but, mentioned. I think maybe once that word is mentioned in chapter one, so it's very easy to overlook. Yeah, it was pretty small. I remembered, but that's okay. Yeah, in chapter one, um, after Nier is talking to Lork about getting finding the Arun in that um, cabin, and Lork says. Why would the Shadow Blades have the Arun anyway? Which kind of tells you that the people that were there torturing him and that were protecting this hideout are the Shadow Blades. At least, you know, you can infer that. But it's very easy to uh, overlook that moving forward or forget it, I mean. I think uh, one of my favorite parts of this chapter was when, you know, just all of the banter, they were just friends hanging out in this cool place near and Lork are taking a swim, um, you know, and Gil's just kind of standing off and they're just all like bantering with each other like they're not in the situation that they're in. So it, it was good to just kind of have that like that, that brush. Like a carefree moment. Right. Yeah. Where it's just, you know, like not as everything is as dire. There's nothing like overwhelming that we need to take care of. There's nothing like pushing us to to act out in desperation. We're just in the moment having fun. But yeah, I'm definitely definitely excited to read on. Uh, I know these next two chapters are pretty short. They're like seven pages each, I think. So it should take long. I haven't even looked ahead to see yet. So, And um, I did want to mention, too, just as like a fun little note, that whenever Lorik gets the ocarina and he thinks that it's enchanted like the one he had before, where when he would blow into it, people were kind of forced magically to dance and they couldn't really help it. Things like that are sprinkled throughout the book, especially between Nier and Lorik, because they've spent a lot of time together. Um, it kind of brings up some of their past and some of the things that they've been through or some things that they've gone through or places that they've been. And that a lot of those scenes are going to be in Nier's prequel, The Broken. So I thought it was kind of interesting i guess because they all these little things kind of get brought up but you never really experience them i guess because they happened in the past so i think it'll be really fun to really go back and see those happening in real time before book one i don't know i just thought it was just kind of like a fun little thing people don't know obviously but you'll have like a whole prequel with Nier and loric sometime in the future that'll be fun <laughs> that'll be fun it's always nice to kind of see 
what things are referred to. Well, I guess any other thoughts on this this chapter at all, or I don't I don't think I've got any. I like you. I'm excited to read the next two chapters and and see where we go from here. Yeah, me as well. I yeah, it was a it was a nice chapter. I feel like it was transitional in uh, setting up for the next chapter. Uh, just kind of that transition between chapter four, finding the book, uh, establishing that they have a place, a safe place to stay in this ancient cave, and then some some down downtime before the next rise of action. I, I'm gonna th- my I guess prediction here for the next two chapters. I would think we're probably gonna see them leave the cave here at this point. I I guess we'll find out. Maybe there's more time to be spent in the cave, but I I feel without having read ahead, I feel like it's, it's time they move on. Yes. I would agree with that. I feel like that's probably my prediction uh, as well. What's yours HC? What's your prediction? I think the cave is not Michelle and they just don't know it yet. So the whole book is going to be spent in this cave. Sorry. Oh shit. Oh man. (laughs) This is going to turn into saw somehow. It's going to be a torture (laughs) movie. Oh, funny, 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 funny. Well, cool. I guess great episode, y'all. It was fun. It was fun. It was very enjoyable. I uh, definitely didn't think I was going to be putting on my voice acting today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did it, though. And but, I mean, we'll we'll learn from it, and next time we'll be better. And I mean, we kind of it's a trial and error, so it's it, obviously we're not professionals, so. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Someone yeah, calls unprofessional. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. I was crying. <laughs> I, have to, I have to compose myself next time. I made you cry? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Terrible. You did. Terrible. Dude, I'm, I'm still yeah. holding back tears, but I'll get through it. Fuck. <laughs> I liked your little dance you did earlier. I can't remember what you were dancing for. <laughs> yeah. Why are you dancing? I forgot. Because I predicted that uh, Nier is one of the divines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I just did my little dance, my little white man dance. Nothing was ever confirmed or denied. See, so. I win. <laughs> it wasn't denied, so. <laughs> I win. <laughs> we'll yeah. find out the answer is in 10 years when the yeah, series is over. Probably. Probably what you're going to do is you're going to be like, that's a great idea. I should write that in. I'm like, please, please tell me all of your theories because they might be better than the ideas that I have. <laughs> well, I <laughs> that's not on. what I'm saying. Come on. <laughs> I'm saying that you could say you can take theories and your ideas and pen, pineapple, apple, pen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'll just let everybody else write. Ideas. I'll just have them all give me the ideas without realizing it. There you go. See? It's like, Crowd crowdsourcing a book, perfect idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I would thank you so much for taking you know close to three hours of your day here with us and and doing this. It was a ton of fun, and hopefully we didn't scare you off from doing this for the rest of the book. So, oh, I, no. which that's going to be a lot of fun to do this the rest of the way with you. So, hopefully I'm looking like forward it. to it. Yeah. <laughs> I th- I think well I yeah I hope people get a kick out of this because as much I hope it comes through on the other end the listening end that it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun to record and and do this so I hope it sounds like it was a lot of fun too. We're gonna listen to the recording and be like, eh, next Sunday we're just redoing these two chapters. <laughs> it's done. We got we're moving on. That ship the sail. <laughs> yep. No, there are. Uh, trust me, I want to go back and fix our first three episodes so much. Ah, uh, no. It's the beginning. It, it, the beginning is always kind of rough for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't have any audio equipment. I hadn't figured out, like, how to make the sound good post, post-production. post Took us a little bit to figure out our format. And, but we're, I think we're kind of in our stride now. I think we got it pretty much dialed in until we decide to do something different like this. Right. Yeah. As long as you're improving, that's really all that matters. Like, as long as, you know, you kind of keep just moving forward and realize... Well, that may not have worked. Let's let's do something different. Right. I think we're pretty adaptable. I think so too. But uh, yeah, I guess with that, uh, I'll bid you all do and uh, enjoy the rest of your all days. Well, thank you all for having me on. This is really fun. And I hope that everybody enjoys it. And I hope I haven't scared you guys off because I had a lot of fun. <laughs> no, we are not. Scared. No, def- definitely not scared off. Okay. No. <laughs> all right. Well, 
thank you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. We'll talk soon. Have a good Sunday, guys. Bye. Bye, y'all.